Welcome. It's very nice to see you uh, today on this afternoon. We have a wonderful speaker today, and with this um, presentation, we, in Modern Languages and Cultural Studies, we are beginning our MLCS lecture series for the year. This lecture is co-sponsored by the Department of Modern Languages and Cultural Studies, as well as by the Ukrainian Language Education Center at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. We have a distinguished speaker today, uh, Monica Perenia, and I would like to ask my colleague Olenka Bilash to introduce our speaker today. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. So, uh, Dr. Monica Perenia has a degree in, Can in Catalan philology from the University of Barcelona and a diploma of French studies from the University of Toulouse Le Mirail in France. She followed a doctoral program in contemporary Catalan literature from theory to practice at the University of Barcelona and a research program on the language equity and educational policy leap. Um, at the School of Education at Stanford University. She has as well an executive master's degree in public administration from the ESADE Business School. She is currently Deputy Director of Language and Multilingualism at the Ministry of Education in Catalonia, from where she runs the linguistic policy of the Catalan education system. From that position, she develops linguistic programs oriented to improve teachers' performance on the methodological field and in school organization, and has responsibility for in-service teacher training. She's a former head of the Language Research Directorate of Language Policy and head of language training at the School of Public Administration of Catalonia, has large experience in teaching languages and in developing resources and tools for language learning and teaching, as well as in language assessment. She is a former, or is still a member of the Association of Language Testers in Europe. She is currently the president of LinguaPax, an international organization dedicated to the protection and promotion promotion of linguistic diversity worldwide. And it is in that capacity that she arrived in Edmonton because the International and Heritage Languages Association, an umbrella organization for uh, community language schools, was the recipient of the 2016 Lingua Pax Prize. And the organization tomorrow will be receiving the award from Lingua Pax. We were very fortunate to extend her stay by a few days so that she could give some talks and visit some of our schools and programs. I have had the pleasure of uh, meeting with uh, Dr. Perenia every day and uh, thoroughly enjoying all of our conversations, and I'm sure that you will be very interested in this talk as she presents with great passion um, the uh, Catalan School. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olenka, for your presentation, and thank you very much to, to the um, Ukrainian studies for in, inviting me here to that presentation. Um, I'm really very happy to be here, to be in Edmonton. It's my first time, not in Canada, but, yeah, but uh, in Alberta. And uh, as I am really very interested in linguistic <coughs> diversity and how languages can deal in different fields, uh, I've seen different insights from different communities which has given me um, a broadened approach to what uh, different languages in the world are and are together and work together and maybe it's one of the, the examples that we should follow in other parts of the world to um, improve this uh, international understanding that really languages help to have. My presentation today is about the, the linguistic model of the Catalan school. As you know, in, in Catalonia, which is a region of Spain, uh, there's a, a, a language that's the, the language, the original language of this region that uh, lives together with, uh, Sp with Spanish language. Both are official in the territory, uh, so they ha both have the same rights and the, the, set, the same duties. Uh, but as our society 
as many societies in the world uh, are multilingual, we have to give an approach to the, ed to the education uh, to the education system that helps our students to become real plurilingual citizens in the future. So I, I will try in this few minutes that I have uh, what we are doing to provide to these students this approach and the knowledge that they will need to be real plurilingual, but above all, to have the tools to keep on learning languages all over their lives. So just uh, to give some little information about what Catalonia is, here you can see the dimensions. It is like some other countries in Europe. As you know, the European linguistic diversity is, is very wide, very varied, and there are many different countries with many different amounts of, of, of speakers. So just to have a little comparison, you can see this. Also some information about the population about seven and a half million of speakers, and the, the situation in, in, in the context of, the, of Spain. Also, you can see the levels, the educational levels. We have all these. The compulsory education grows, goes from six to 18 years, uh, to 16 years old, sorry. Then there's the, there's the post-secondary education, the baccalaureate or the vocational education, and then there's the university. Preschool and nursery are not compulsory, but around 90% of kids from three to six years attend schools, and it's free. It's, it's, uh, it's, it be, it's part of the funds that the state provides for education. So even if it's not compulsory, uh, it's, uh, it's for free for the parents. It's not free because it's very expensive, but for the families it's free. So the types of schools that we have, we have state schools, so public schools, uh, state subsidized schools, which are private, but a part of the cost of these schools comes from the state, such as the salaries of the teachers. And there are some other independent private schools, but which are less than 3% of schools. So the majority of schools are uh, public or subsidized. Sorry. Um, the number of pupils, around 1,500,000 students. And you can see how they are distributed into, in, into, into the public and private sector. So there are much more public schools, so much part of the students go to the public schools. The teachers, we have around 107,000 teachers in the whole system, and they are distributed, distributed like that among uh, primary and secondary education and public and private sector, just that's not very important. Uh, the in-service training that we provide to all these teachers aims to these three goals, to give support to school projects. So we are focusing very much on the school projects more than in the, uh, in, in the individual training, to improve prof uh, teachers' professional competencies and to improve teacher trainers' competencies. Mm? So the, the learning, the, the capacity of their language the learning and the competencies that they need to to show. So the framework in the teacher training scheme is that in the past it was usually addressed to individuals, so it was a, a, a varied range of courses that were offered and each teacher could choose what, were, what he was interested in. Now uh, the, the training is addressed to schools. It, the, it's the team of teachers that have to apply some specific training according to their specific project, because every school has to have a project uh, according to their community. Uh, it used to be face-to-face. -face. Now there's a big amount of training online. Many, many teachers attend courses online. 
and uh, the assessment was usually focusing on participant satisfac satisfaction, so they, they have to answer a survey and that's it. And now they have to show the achievement of the training that they have received by presented some, presenting some project that they have been doing in the classroom. So we have to, um, to see that they have been using the results of the training in the real uh, production. Well, here you can see the, the different kinds of, uh, of teaching, of uh, seminars and courses and whatever, and the virtual platforms where they can find the courses to, the, to, to attend. And this other one, the Ateneu, is a, um, um, I don't know the word, Repository, com se diria? Repository. repository, the repository of, of materials and examples of good practices. So they can go there and check uh, and compare other practices from other teachers. Well, go, going to the linguistic model, that was uh, just some data to, to, to situate you. The linguistic model focuses on this idea that language diversity is uh, a broad, is shared, is a shared and a, uh, and a global reality. So, plurilingualism is something that has to be addressed to all the students because they need it to interact in a in a world that is globalized and more and more complex. Just to see uh, an example, this is the. The Twitter, one of the, phot the photos uh, from the Twitter, um, well, the people mm, tweeting uh, in different languages. You can see the diversity in Europe. Mm? But do you think that that is diversity or plurilingualism? This is diversity, but it is, is it really plurilingualism, what is shown in this picture? We could say maybe it's multilingualism. No, there are many languages with different speakers in different parts, but all the speakers in Spain are treating in the same language. So are they really plurilingual? Maybe not. Or the same in Italy, in France, in Germany, whatever. Well, that's Catalonia. It's a bit more mixed. So that shows up that there, there are at least two communities that interact in two languages. You can see it's a little bit different, the color. But what I mean, or, or what I, wish I would like to show with that picture, is that uh, what's the difference, the difference when we talk about uh, multilingualism and plurilingualism? Hmm? One thing has to do with the territories, the other thing has to do with the speakers, with the individuals. So that uh, speaking many different languages is something that... Uh, is needed, at least in contexts like Europe, because you know, uh, and especially when we are talking about a small language as Catalan, that we need other different languages, we should, uh, we should think in the ways how to make, really, that students achieve this, this competence. The first thing... I will take this here, because it's uh, turning around. Oh. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. No, oh, it's. Sorry. No problem. Put it here. Okay. Sorry. Then, the first thing that we have to take into account is why we have to pay attention to languages and to language education. The first thing that we take into account then is that, as the Council of Europe says in his documents, is that quality language education is a prerequisite for quality education overall. You know, if you can have the manage of the language, it's very difficult that you can get uh, the knowledge from the information that you can have. So. Uh, the first thing that you have to do is um, be aware that your uh, language of, of instruction, that can be one or two or even three, are well taught in order that the, the students get the tool that they will need 
to uh, after uh, achieve all the contents that they have to do in different subjects and matters. What the Council of Europe says is that uh, this language education is key not only for the educational and professional success, but also because it's necessary for their personal development of the students because the students will be grown-ups, they, but they will have to be learning for the rest of their lives. And if they don't have the tool that, the, that will provide them the knowledge, they will not be successful and uh, feel like they, they are um, real citizens that ca can interact in a democratic context. So if they have not critical thinking, if, have, if they cannot decide in what information is correct or not, they will not be able to interact in the complex societies where we live. So it's important for economic growth because if we have different speakers and, and people prepared to do um, jobs that need skills um, more um, according to the to, to this competence, um, we will not have cit um, citizen, citizens capable to interact in democratic societies and to foster uh, social cohesion. So when we talk about language education, we are talking about these things. And especially we have all the information from the different uh, reports like PISA or PILS that say that, education, that educational failure is partly determined by, in a, by in an inadequate command of a wide range of linguistic uh, forms. So if they cannot understand clearly the questions that they have to answer, difficultly they will be able to achieve the goals of education. So, I will give you as well a historical and sociolinguistic um, context so that you can understand what's happening there. At that moment, uh, Catalonia is a, is a mosaic of languages and cultures. There are censored more than 280 languages in, in our region, so there are a many diverse populations. But where do we come from? Not that far away, we are talking about uh, th this period when um, there was the end of the civil war, 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 war yeah, the civil war in Spain, um, the situation was that there was in internal waves of immigration from other parts of Spain to Catalonia because it was the development, the economic development was situated in this area. So during the 50s, and 60s, and especially the 70s of the previous century, uh, there was a very big movement of these parts, of other parts of Spain, that represented almost 50% of the population. So when, um, during the 40s, 90% of people in Catalonia speak only Catalan, at the end of the 70s, it was half to half. So it has been a big movement of of people that have arrived with, with a different languages. At that moment, school was monolingual. Only in Spanish, Catalan was forbidden. And the foreign languages that were taught at school were Latin and Greek, which, which were dead languages, or so-called dead languages, and French. But, French. but was French was taught as a, almost as Latin and Greek, so there was no oral interaction, etc. So the teaching of languages was not something that was very in, important. Some years after, with the, uh, with the ad, uh, adventure of democracy and autonomy, the, and the passing the, these different linguistic laws in Catalonia, the school changed completely. So we changed the language of school, the language of schooling, the language of school and the language of schooling, both, uh, through the program of in immersion program, and that means uh, a huge movement of teacher training because we have to renew many many things. So, since 1983, it was uh, put uh, 
this action plan for bilingual education in Catalonia that began in 1983 with the aim of increasing language proficiency of citizens in Catalan and in Spanish. We were based on that project, uh, on, on that model, or methodology, methodology, methodological model that was already being uh, set on in different parts of the world, especially in Quebec, you may be aware of that, and it was one of the models that we took at that moment, but also in different parts of the, of the United States of America, in, some, uh, in, the, in Wales, and in some parts of, in, in the parts of Sweden where, uh, uh, sorry, the parts of Finland where Swed Swedish is also speaking. So this, uh, this uh, linguistic immersion program is a second language teaching program, as you all know, that allows students to, to learn and build knowledge in a language different from this, from this own. That was for Catalan and Spanish. So teachers could speak Catalan and Spanish. It was rather easy to introduce that. But the methodology is the same methodology that they are using nowadays many different countries, especially in Europe, to introduce foreign languages, and that is called CLIL. It, it is based on the same, in, on the same methodolo methodological approach. The targets of this program, you know, are these, these that I have listed here. Hmm? It's in order to, to learn teach language and content at the, same, at the same level, apply individualized immersion strategies in late incorporation processes when the students arrive later uh, and have to be in the, in the system um, when they are 12, 13 years old, you have to take uh, different approaches to help them to incorporate in the, in the system. Uh, promotes linguistic continuities between school and social environment. That's very important. That was a, par a very important part of the program to fulfill this uh, idea that the language uh, is not only learned in the academic way, it has to be learned in the context, so that's very important. And so that's what's happening when we try to, lear to learn English or French on a foreign language, that we have to try to look for context where to use this language. If for the Catalan and, Span and Spanish, it was easy. It was in the same society that you could find both contexts. Now for, for English, for French, for uh, Arabic, etc., the languages that are taught at school, it's, it's different. The priority lines for this primary education from three to six to from sorry from six to twelve were those. It was also very important um, to make this uh, coherence in linguistic usages at school. So, if you know how the program in Quebec wo works uh, or is, it's very important that uh, what you do in the school in the classroom is already done in school because if not, the kids don't understand uh, what language do they have to use in any context. And it's very important also to deal with family languages of all these students. When you arrive to the secondary education, you have, uh, the kids have already the communicative, they have acquired the communicative functions uh, and they have already some linguistic skills. So in the secondary school, it's very important the to keep on uh, working with the language, but in the context of the different subjects um, uh, or, or context from school. Once we have all these organized, they have passed among 20 years or 25 years, we have another big wave of new immigration that arrived to Catalonia. You can see from uh, 2000, there were at around 23, uh, thousand students, more or less, and in 2009 we, there were already 160. So that means that in that period we passed from 5%, more or less, to almost 14 in those years. So the, um, the, demogra the demographic evolution of Catalonia shows how all these uh, pupils have, or, or the context of the school has changed. You can see 
In 1981, only 1.5% 1 of population was born outside Catalonia, and 30, almost 35% were born in, the, in other parts of Spain. In 2014, and the average of people uh, that was born in Catalonia is more or less the same, so they, 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 it's, it's stable. But then you, have, you see at the end the shift. Nowadays, 17% of the people of, uh, living in Catalonia has not been born there. So this big amount of population has, has had to be integrated in society and especially in schools. Here you can have uh, an idea that where the, these newcomers come from. The biggest group comes from Morocco. And then there are some other different, you, you will see the other big group is from Ecuador, but there are also some other students coming from other countries from South America. So there's a big group of newcomers that speak Spanish as first language. This, this coming from Morocco can speak or Arabic or Berber because they come from the north part of Morocco, so more, most of them speak Berber more than Arabian, and the others, well, you can see from all these different origins. So the languages more used for these students are in, in almost 40% of the newcomers, it's Spanish, but all the others are these, Arabian, Roman, Chinese, Urdu, Amazigh, which is very, very well, all these languages. So there are communities of people speaking all, all those languages. Uh, when building a plurilingual education system, what do we have to take into account? We want several monolingual societies or we want one plurilingual society? We think that the aim is to take advantage of the linguistic richness of the country, and we consider that learning an international language is, is good. Mm -hmm. So we have to create this such a network, network or puzzle to incorporate every, everybody. To do that, which are the, uh, the Catalan uh, system premises? First of all, the, uh, we have decided, and it has been an agreement that passed in the Parliament, and it was supported by 100% of the members of Parliament, so it's a big agreement that passed by in 1983 and was renewed in 1998. Catalan is the language of schooling and been much for an integrated language learning system. So there's only one school, the same for everybody. There are not bilingual schools in all of these languages. All the schools have the same premises. Catalan is language of schooling and they are, uh, the other goals are that Catalan and Spanish have to be learned at the same level when students finish compulsory education, as well as with another language, with another foreign language. Students have to choose between among English, French, Italian, and German. They can choose. 99% of students, do you guess what language do they choose? English, easy. <laughs> Easy. Hmm? But some others, there are some students, that's small groups, but some students that choose especially French and some of them also German. But in general, they, they choose English. So in all schools of Catalonia, there are these three languages that are compulsory for all students. And plus, they have to choose another secondary language, another second language that can be French, German, or Italian. But... Uh, there are also all these languages of the newcomers, so uh, we are trying to incorporate these languages uh, in the system so that the students that can speak or even that are learning these languages out of school in programs like yours here uh, could be uh, introduced in the school system and, re and be recognized as uh, if they, they were the curricular languages that are English, French. German or Italian. How do we do that? We have, uh, at the beginning of the school, when they are three years old, we have uh, children that speak only Catalan, 
children that speak Catalan and Spanish, children that speak only Spanish, and children that speak any other languages which are not Catalan or Spanish. And all of them have to achieve this goal, that is to know the two official languages plus one foreign language. So the school has to provide to all students the skills needed to become competent and engaged citizens. And we do that applying second language methodologies, different second language methodologies, because every school has to build up its educational school project. And in this educational school project, there's a specific project, which is the linguistic project. This linguistic project has to take into account that Catalan and Occitan, I didn't say it to you, there's a little corner on the top uh, east of Catalonia where people speak Occitan because it was part of the Occitan community that is, as you know, broad in the south of France. And it has recognized that as well as an official language of Catalonia. So schools in that area teach in Occitan. They use Occitan in the same level as we use Catalan in the other schools. But they have to learn Catalan as well, because Catalan is the language, the official language of Catalonia. So these kids, it's a very, very small population. There are only 6,000 uh, people living there, but they have three primary schools and one secondary school. And in those schools, they have to learn Catalan, Occitan, Catalan, Spanish, and first foreign language, or two, it depends. So this linguistic project has to take into account that, which are the language, which are the languages, principal languages of schooling, but how, how are the kids going to learn all the other languages? And what are they going to do with the languages of the newcomers? Because as all schools are different, there are many schools that have very few immigrants, so it's easy for them to organize the learning of the languages. Some others, 90% of the students uh, are foreigners, and maybe there are 10 languages or 12 languages used in these classes or in these schools. So it's much more complex to organize the learning of the languages of these kids. And that has to be recognized in this linguistic project uh, that uh, has to take into account that the school has to be inclusive, plurilingual, and pluricultural, and they have to do that taking in mind what I was saying at the beginning, the difference between multilingualism and plurilingualism. So it's important that we have a multilingual society, so it's important that every community can keep their own language, but also it's very important that the school provides the kids with this competence that it's the so-called plurilingual competence, which is different. But it's like the Council of Europe says that it's rather, rather to, build, to build up a communicative competence to which all knowledge and experiences of languages contribute and which languages interrel in, interrelate and interact. So it's to develop the idea that if you know one language, you have already a linguistic knowledge. So when you are going to learn a second language, you have to think, what do I know about grammar, about vocabulary, uh, and make the connections, and that is, you, you cannot learn like that. You have to, know, to have somebody that helps you to make these connections. These are, there are methodologies that do that, which are called translingual uh, education or uh, the in, integrated treatment of languages that help students to make these connections. And the plurilingual approach means that. Can you read it or is uh, you are too far? Because I, I wouldn't like to to spend much, much time uh, reading. But well, it's, it's that. It's, it's to develop the linguistic repertory in which all linguistic abilities have a place. Mm -hmm. So it's the, this interconnection. It's not simply to achieve mastery of one or two or even th three languages, each taken in isolation, with the ideal native speaker and the ultimate model. This idea that you when you are learning a language, you have to learn it as if you were a native speaker, mm, it's not, well, 
maybe it's an ideal, but it, it doesn't work like that. So if you can communicate, even you need uh, different means of communication de depending on the context where you are. So sometimes you will need only to understand. Sometimes you will need only to write or to read some information just to get the idea of the content that something is, is, is trying to say to you. So it's not necessary to learn all the languages at the, sale, at the same level. Just to have the abilities to understand when you can make connection between, between the information uh, of different languages that you, that you have. And to do that, we are working uh, through different strategies. The most important one is this integrated language learning and inter in integrated language with content learning. The CLIL approach, but also the integrated language learning. If you can imagine that um, the kids at schools in secondary education have um, four, four hours per week of Catalan language, four hours per, per week of Spanish language, four hours per week of English or French or whatever they have chosen as, as first language, and three hours per week if they have chosen a second foreign language. That's 12 hours of language. If you teach them, well, we are going to explain the direct complement in Catalan. Then arrived the, the Spanish teacher. We are going to speak about this, the complement. The kids, they say, oh my gosh, again and again. But that's what's been working since now. So every teacher with his um, books, with his students, and um, speaking and explaining what, what they think it, it was, its own or his own or her own subject. Now the idea is that the teachers could work cooperatively, cooperatively and they can uh, share and make the program, the programmations together and work through genres and text and share and make more insights in what they are teaching. And then the, the, the project or the, or the results will, will be much better. Uh, what about the, the heritage languages? Um, what do we want? Or what do people think? At the beginning they think, well, after a couple of generations they will be um, assimilated and we, we, don't, we don't need to, to pay any attention. But um, that's not like that. Languages, it has been a practice in many countries, uh, but the results, especially we have very bad examples in Europe, for instance, in the banlieues of Paris, of Paris uh, where have been many important programs because um, these communities have not been um, integrated in a correct way. So we have to look for other models, uh, and that's what we are trying to do. Hmm? Uh, That's why mm, it's very important to, or, or the importance that the host society gives to the newcomers' languages is very important when, especially when considering uh, medium and long-term repercussions. A crucial aspect to ensure is equal opportunities and to avoid sc school conflict. If you cannot uh, share to the students that all the languages are the same, they, all of them ha have the same values, even they have u different uses in a different society, um, you are not going to give really this plurilingual approach. So that's very important to make the languages present at the school, to uh, help every student that has a different language to show to its, his mates uh, or her mates that uh, they have some capabilities, some abilities that are also as useful as the others. That's why we have been ruling for the last 10 years this origin languages program that we call, which uh, tries to um, involve 
the, the associations or the communities uh, of these foreign languages in the schools providing uh, lang language classes of these students, not only for the speakers of these languages, but for the whole community. So these classes are open to all the students. Um, as you know, some languages are more popular than others, and for instance, the, the Chinese classes uh, are very popular, and there are many um, Catalan kids that attend these classes. But also, they are, it depends on the area or in the school. Also, the Arabic languages are attended for um, Catalan students or other students. So it has been... Uh, well, we are working on that, but uh, it's something that uh, helps a lot and makes uh, the teachers of the school aware of many, many, many things when you have these extra, extra school classes in your building or in your school. Because we have evidences, we have more than 200 empirical studies that have been carried on during the last years that say that uh, there's a positive association between additive bilingualism. You may know very well because uh, Cummings, uh, Jim Cummings is one of the references uh, of this theory, but it has been really proved um, empirically that the knowledge of different languages helps to know more languages and this transference between these, these things. Uh, the linguistic project which I was talking to you about uh, has these characteristics. So uh, these, are, these are all the languages that are in the schools and there are some methodolo methodological approaches which are organized like that. Hmm? Language of schooling with initial immersion, curriculum foreign languages with CLIL methodology, the transversal integration of languages, the, the TIL skills that I was talking about, and the transference of skills to from family languages. That's why uh, tools like the portfolio or different tools that show uh, the knowledge of different languages that the students have are very interesting to show around. And that, the challenges are, that's it, the general idea, but the challenges are how to fit the linguistic project to each particular situation. Because as we have been, uh, the composition of the students of each school is different. So, uh, from the official existing curriculum nowadays, uh, we have to give a communicative and linguistic competence in the basis of, lear of every le learning process. That's written in the curriculum. So we have the, the, the mandatory uh, idea in the curriculum that has to be de developed. Uh, and uh, all the curricular area, area, areas are responsible of this development. So this linguistic approach is not something that is the responsibility of the, language, of the teacher of language, any language, but of the whole community. Because if you are teaching maths or sciences or whatever, if you don't have, if you don't take into account that these kids can understand better or, or worse the language of schooling, you are not going to succeed in, in, in giving them all the information that they need. Which are these challenges for foreign students' integration. As we have seen, we have this, all this number of students. That means that more than uh, one million and a half of students have been incorporated in the system. And then we have to take into account all these things, these challenges that are new to our system, which are Welcome foreign students whenever they arrive to the system. That has been a very important issue to address. Because when you are, if you are teachers, you, you know it. If you are in a classroom and in the middle of the year it arrives a student that doesn't understand nothing of the language of schooling, you have to, and if it's one, well, you can make an individualized plan, etc. But if they are 10 or 12, what, what 
can you do with all that students and with the others that they are already in the classroom? So you, you have to, to, to look for the solution to attend <coughs> these students. You have to guarantee them the acquisition of basic communi communicative competence to follow up the classes. You have to fit curricula to their needs and to their level. So you have to do all these things when you are a teacher or, or when you are a team of teachers. You have to offer personalized teaching. You have to incorporate linguistic and cultural diversity to the school and to the classroom so to help uh, these students to get in and to the others to understand the situation. You have to, you have to encourage family involvement. In families, they, they have to understand how the, school, how the school works and how can they help their, their kids to fit in it better. And to give, and you have to give emotional support to overcome the migratory grief and improve the sense of belonging to the, to the society of reception. So they are a mixture of things that you have to do in the middle of the year with a very, group, a, a very big group of students. So um, if the basic goal is of education is equity and, edu and educative success for all the students, you have to do all these things. You have to introduce the newcomers to the new school, to have to give them in individual and personalized attention, and you have to look for family implication. How, to, how do we do that? We have established uh, something that I don't know how, very well how to translate, and I have put welcome or, or host classroom. It's a space in the same school where these kids start to learn the language. They are not uh, in that classroom all the school time, just 12 hours per week. Uh, the rest of the hours, they have to be with their mates in the P, P classroom, in the music classroom, where they don't need that much the language. They could stay with, with, their, with their mates. On the other time, they have to stay in that classroom that provides them this personalized attention that they need, the Catalan language learning, which is the language that they will need to go into the main mainstream classroom, they treat their emotional aspects because they stay in that classroom just when they arrive, and they give them access to curricula. They can stay in this kind of classroom only for two years. After two years, they have acquired this basic competence that helps them to go into the mainstream. So the, the, the picture that I was showing before is added with this, uh, with this idea of the Aula de Collida, which is the host classroom, that provides these students with the A2 level. Only they, they, when they finish these two years uh, being in that, in that welcoming classroom, they achieve the A2 level of the framework, the European framework. So that helps them to understand what's happening in the classroom. But if the goals of the system is to achieve a B2 at the end of the education, the compulsory education, there is a gap that has to be fulfilled because if they are in A2 and they have to arrive in B2, how are they going to do it? if they don't have more, more help after this just welcoming classroom. So we have had, just to, to see the figures, we have had in the years where most of these children have arrived, 1,236 uh, welcoming classroom, that means 1,236 uh, 1, teachers doing, extra teachers doing this support. So that has been a big effort of the government to cover these, these necessities. But after the initial welcome that it's, well, to introduce them to the school, the time that they pass in the reception classroom and the time that they need to go to the ordinary classroom, they have many difficulties. And we see that migrant student, students uh, achieve basic communication, but they don't achieve the results that uh, we are waiting. 
For example, the last PISA results, because the 2015 we don't have the results yet, um, these are the differences between the Catalan and the immigrant students. So their performance is lower than the Catalan students' performance. That's not only because of their lack of language skills, but is partly because of that. So, uh, and the same for the, for the external exams of our system. It's also almost 70, 70 points of difference between uh, the two groups. So what does it mean? You, you may be aware of that. Uh, if you need, oh, sorry, five years to achieve the normal competence to follow the curricula, and you have them only two years in this welcoming classroom, you need something else to help them to arrive uh, and to get the cognitive and academic language competence that they need to uh, achieve the goals of the system. So, this cannot be learned spontaneously. It's proved. And it can be better taught if integrated in non-linguistic areas rather than in the linguistic ones. So, uh, the teachers that are teaching math, sciences, history, whatever, have to incorporate in their teaching methodologies that help this scaffolding to help the students to get the language that they need to, to reach the contents of the curriculum. That's mm, not the Catalan government who has invented that, of course. That there are many reports and interesting uh, reports of the Council of Europe and of the OCDE, uh, OCDE that uh, make the, those recommendations. And based on that report and on that inform information, we have developed a resource that we have called the social and linguistic support, that it's the support that we give to, to them when they finish, oh, sorry, uh, they stay in the reception classroom. So for three more years, they will help this uh, support from the ordinary teachers and from one teacher that is in the school and helps and supports the, 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 the teacher in the classroom to split the group in a small groups, to do more oral activities or interaction activities, whatever is necessary depending on the, on the level of this group of students, this specific group of students. Well, and we have called that. It's, it's to access to curriculum and uh, to develop these multiple identities, which is very popular at that moment, but very difficult to do. So what are the challenges in, in, in the language learning now? Apart from those that we have already seen, we have this uh, Europe 2020 strategy for education that uh, tries to provide the students the skills they will need to get uh, the jobs of the future or the present already. So uh, they make uh, emphasis on the language learning and to modernize methodologies because students and teachers have to move around. So they, this strategy aims to the mobility of students of teachers around Europe. So to move around, they need to learn languages because if not, it's very difficult. So, and to do that, it uh, stimulates the cooperation and collaboration among students um, or, among, or among schools. That's why the um, project, the European program Erasmus Plus is very, very good valued in, in the schools there. And also improve vocational education, which, ne which means that you have to incorporate the language of learning in these studies, which is very weak at that moment. And why we should do that? Then because the labor market demands have changed. All the routine uh, and manual tasks are, are going down because it's the robots that are putting the, 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 the fruit on the cases or the pieces of the car. Uh, so what the demands of the new labor market 
are, are demanding on communication skills and in a com cognitive level and higher cognitive level. That uh, survey and a report that was doing that that has been done in the in the United States, but the labor market market at that moment is the same uh, everywhere. So, what do we have to do to improve the language learning of, of our students to achieve these competencies that the labor market demands? Then it's to learning languages to communicate more than to learn languages per se. So it has to be a functional learning and user-oriented. Uh, learning languages to do things with languages. It has to be a meaningful learning and, and action-oriented because if, if it's not meaningful, you are not going to learn anything. It, you have to learn languages to solve real-life problems. You need the competencies and the collaborative learning to interact with peers, with colleagues, uh, etc. We need to assess to learn, to change the idea that uh, you have to pass a test. No, you have to learn uh, to learn to learn in a way. No, you have to transform language learnings to magnify to maximize the efficacy, the, the efficiency and the efficacy of, le of learning, to avoid duplication is what was uh, saying before. Uh, to recognize and validate the informal and non-formal learning, which is very important, so we have tools to do that. So in fact, is uh, to change from teaching languages to teaching to learn languages, so to make the students more autonomous in their process. And that's why we do that emphasis on, competence, uh, on content and language integrated learning, because it's a methodology that is based on producing things, on using the languages to do things. This methodology and the other one, which is the, um, based on, uh, on project, uh, on, on, well, the, the project-based uh, approach, uh, which are both uh, very competential, is that both the two methodologies that are better to transform the learning languages. And this transformation is as well an opportunity for ed education innovation because it promotes structural changes in the school system. It's not only the methodology, methodolo methodological change, but also the organization uh, um, um, uh, change that is produced because ch teachers have to organize differently. They have to cooperate, to have to um, prepare uh, things together. They have to organize things differently. So the changes are in the, the roles of teachers and students. The teacher is not anymore the one who transmits the knowledge and the, teach and the student uh, learns. It's someone who accompanies the student in its process of learning, uh, the, the, the learning through all languages and subjects is what we have been talking about all that time. And the, ch the changes in the classroom, the classroom must be a flexible structure and the, the Kids have to work in pairs, in groups. They can do different kinds of activities, the flipped classrooms, all these kind of methodologies that uh, promote these different ways of learning, and new <coughs> training strategies for the teachers, and new professional development. Because when you try to teach, uh, to change the methodology, you are also teaching to change the, world, the way of working. Finally, uh, because the, the educational policies goals are focused all over in competencies and inclusion. And languages have a lot to say in, in those main topics. Finally, learning, learning languages, uh, because it helps us to understand the world and to participate actively in it because it is through languages that we connect and learn to live together. 
because plurilingualism helps us to see the world through the, through the eyes of others. Because lang learning languages is to live together and finally to help them change the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Freya, for a very interesting talk. Um, I believe that we probably will take about uh, maybe five, ten minutes of discussion. I would like to invite you all because we can then carry our conversation. We have, if it's still there, but it was there about ten minutes ago, uh, we have some uh, refreshments. So I would like to invite all of you to stay a little bit longer and to have an opportunity uh, to, to, to share your thoughts, to ask questions uh, with our speaker. So we, we have some time for, for questions, and I know we have a very interdisciplinary audience here. Thank you. So who would like to start? Um, we're going to see by from Modern Languages and Cultural Studies. Uh, thank you again for this is very informative presentation, and I learned a lot of these things. Um, there, I, I, I would like to ask a um, question which is uh, related to um, Catalan Spanish language education in Catalonia, and you mentioned in your presentation that in school in Catalonia, uh, students have four hours of instruction for the Catalan and Spanish languages, and four hours for other foreign languages. So, but what about the content courses? So what is the language of instruction of such courses as mathematics, science, and so forth? The language of instruction is Catalan. But uh, as every school has its own linguistic project, they can decide, each school can decide, and it's provided in the law, that they can um, use some other languages uh, of, of instruction in some subjects. For instance, uh, in an area, because the population is distributed differently, so there are some areas with the population is mainly Catalan speaker, while there are other areas, especially um, uh, around the big cities, where Spanish is the most speaking language of the, the, the population in general. So these schools can decide that if the language of the environment is mainly Spanish, they have to make an effort at school and teach everything in Catalan so that it can compensate the uses. If it's in the other way, in the, in the other way, um, in other parts where Catalan is the, ma the main language of the community, and teachers think that they have to reinforce the use of Spanish, they can introduce a subject in Spanish, math, sciences, whatever. And the same thing are they doing with the uh, other languages. There are um, around 70% of schools that have already introduced some subjects or part of subjects in other languages, especially in English, but some also in French. Mm -hmm. So they can, you can have a school with uh, three subjects in Catalan, one subject in Spanish, and one subject in, in English. Or more than subjects, what are they doing is working through projects, through school projects. So they have decide every year or every term as a topic, and on that topic they organize a project, a school project. So they, they have part of the project in English, part of the project in Catalan, part of the project in, in Spanish, sometimes part of the, pro of the project in French. Uh, there are some projects with, which try to um, work on the intercomprehension between Romanic languages, so they especially in, in the north where I was talking about Occitan, Catalan, French, because they are close to the border with France. So they have more intercomprehension um, projects of that sort. So I, I know that it's complicated because each school can do differently, but really it's like that. And I think that it's something that I would like to value, to put on value, because even we have been uh, submitted to a... Um, as analysis or a survey from the Council of Europe, and the thing that they have valued the more is that linguistic project in every school, because it really takes into account the reality of the school and, and the context of the school, of course. So it's very flexible in a way. 
it's it, you have to be more reliable on the teachers on on, on the principals of the schools, but at the at the end the the results that the external exams show are good. So they, we don't see any problem in keeping on working on that way. Thank you. Do we have another question? Dr. Patricia, formerly from McEwen University, currently faculty of education. Uh, this is the first time I'm really hearing about this model. And as I listen to it, I'm wondering uh, what are the factors at play in Catalonia uh, that are not present in North America? Uh, that allow you to do this. So the impression I'm getting is the following, that uh, the region is in a bilingual situation, where Catalan is in a minority, but numerous minority vis-a-vis -vis Spanish. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you have a very high immigration, 17%, uh, which probably comes with the EU, the mm -hmm. process of the European Union which is something we don't have in North America. And then uh, I, I'm gathering that uh, you have a, a, not a very multilingual teacher population because you're teaching all these languages, so the teachers must be able to teach them. The, the teachers, all the teachers I are able to teach in Catalan and Spanish. It's a oh. remarkable situation because mm -hmm. I don't very much know. Only America. Catalan and Spanish. Only Catalan yeah. and Spanish. Catalan Unless and Spanish. English teacher, then they also speak English, or if they're the French teacher. A third language in the community. Yeah, but one thing is the teachers that are language teachers in English, in French, or in Italian, or in Portuguese, etc. But does to, to be able to teach math, mathematics, or sciences, or whatever in English or in French, they have to know. They have to be mathematics mathematics teachers or science teachers with all knowledge of the language that's true and we don't we have a part of the teachers that have this knowledge but not all of them so that's why the schools also decide that they can do this subject in math and not in sciences according with the competence of the teacher if it's the teacher of math that knows english they are going to do in math. If, the, if it's the teacher of social sciences that knows English, they are going. So it's a kind of um, flexibility in terms of organization, on, on terms of teachers' competence, in terms of the project of the community. So it's, it's, it's very complicated, complex, I would say, not complicated, it's complex. Uh, and it has to be very, very flexible. So um, that wa that's why some schools do a whole subject, but some others just do a small project. We have, have, have you finished? Did you finish? No. Question. Sorry, he did, fin he did not oh, finish. Sorry, he finished his <laughs> summary. What I'm trying to do is draw out of your experience yeah, yeah, sure. uh, the universal uh, questions that have to be answered in order to implement this model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for us to implement this model here, you, you agree we would have to have a bilingual situation. Like, and we do, between French and English and certain parts of the We would have to have a high immigration. We would have to have multilingual teachers. Uh, we have to have a high political commitment to flexible education. System. That's true. And we'd have to have a European bank to pay for this. <laughs> well, <laughs> more or less, it's very expensive. Well, yeah, true. well, I, I wouldn't say that. What? You could do it. For instance, you have to say, we have been inspired in the, in the Quebec uh, situation. So they, the, the, the teachers there, they can also speak French and English. Do they or not? Or I am wrong? Our, our system are two, well, I'm not a language specialist, but uh, I understand Canada to be two unilingual countries, two unilingual regions, with a little bit of allowance. So in Western Canada, we're English speaking, with a little bit of other languages. And in Quebec, French speaking, with a little bit of other languages. But it really a little bit. We have nothing like this. 
this is this is so progressive that I, I can just clap for you in my eyes. But you can do many, many things as well. Uh, I think that the, the most important thing is the, the, the administration commitment, that I would agree. If the government is not for that, uh, it will be very difficult because there will not be the, the tools to do that. But um, it's also, there's another thing that I don't know if it happens here in Canada, but it's uh, also the, the, the volunteer of the people to to have this plurilingual approach. And I know that when you are an English speaker, everything is easier in the world. So um, why do you have to learn other languages if you go everywhere with your language and everybody's trying to learn your language because it's the most important thing to do in the world? So you, you cannot imagine the pressure, the pressure of the families for the kids to learn English at any cost. They stop doing music, they stop doing sports just to go after school, to, to go to take classes after school because they have to be competent in English. Well, take it easy. They are just kids. They will, they will arrive. Let them stay a little bit. But uh, that's the big difference. And that's something that happens to us in Catalonia with Spanish. Uh, they say, oh, but if, if the, the language of schooling is Catalan, what happens with Spanish? Spanish is everywhere, everywhere, in the media, in the cinema, in the video games, in the press. Uh, where, who is the, pe the person in Catalonia who don't learn Spanish? Nobody, nobody. But there are some people who cannot or don't want to speak Catalan because if one can, the other one can as well. So sometimes it's a question of volunty, no? So the pluralism, pluralism supports the development of Catalan? Yes, yes. Let me suggest that we take one more question and then continue because I'm afraid that our coffee and teas are getting cold, but we can definitely continue on it and perhaps ask this question. I'm sure you probably have security. Okay, so please. Okay, it was a few hours, and I'm, I'm sure the well, guy is more or less the one supposed to be asking me this question, because I belong to the International and Heritage Languages Association, and it's so inspiring that for Bernia, what he had presented to us, because at this very moment, we're still struggling, and when we talk about a family language and a heritage language, and the first language, we're still trying to figure out where we are. Because now there are only a few of our languages that are here in Canada that are part of our educational system. So how only, maybe we have 200 plus languages here, but only 10 are in the other education. So how can we achieve what you have presented to us today? And as Dr. Patricia said, just to be political, <laughs> and to be everything. So I guess Olenia will continue, and Dr. Patricia will continue connecting with you, so that we can get that process going and over there. So give me a difference between the family language and the heritage language, please. The difference? Yeah. Uh, for us, it's the same. There's no difference. We don't use the term of heritage language. It's just the translation into English. We, we talk about languages of origin or we talk about family languages. But they are the same thing. We, do, we don't do the difference. Her, heritage language is something that there's, there, the, the term doesn't exist, nor in Catalan, nor in yeah. Spanish. Here we still have the dialects. We have one language from a country like Portugal, the Philippines. It's called Filipino or the Tagalog, but we still have 75 dialects yeah. that are being used by the families. So I still will say that uh, family language is really just towards the family, yeah. at the same time the heritage is what the region belongs no. to or the origin. We don't do that difference. No. For us, the family languages, but that's true that they are, for instance, when I was talking about the, the kids coming from the north of Morocco, mm -hmm. most of them uh, don't speak Arabic. 
They speak Berber. So when we talk about family languages, we talk about that. The family languages of these kids is Berber, it's not Arabic. Or Chinese, for instance. Um, many of the Chinese, the, the Chinese students that come um, to Catalonia, they don't speak Mandarin. They speak um, Cantonese or another thing that they call dialect, but uh, that I would say that it's language because it's very, very different. Mm, but they are not, um, another thing that we do a lot is to mm, make these kids aware because many of them, for instance, those kids that come from Ecuador, from Peru, most of them speak um, Guarani or, or um, uh, Quechua, a lot of these languages at home. At the beginning, they feel like ashamed to say that, no, I speak Spanish. But when you hear them talking with their mothers when they come, you realize that, no, that's not true. And then when they see that the Catalan language has the same role in a way than the, their own languages, they say, well, th that should be not that bad that I speak that la the language that I speak at home. And so there's a lot of work with these communities that they are mm, keeping their languages. Mm -hmm. And they have been schools that they have been done wonderful works with these kids, and now they are proud, and they are all these languages are also um, present at school and taught. Taught. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs>